Nisha. Um, I'm the co-founder, correction, co-founder of Ecocentric Transitions. I share this burden with Lyman, who's sitting over there. Um, and I just want to have a feel of who's in the audience. Uh, can you share with me if you are a student? Can you become over here? Can you share with me if you are, you've been working for the first like five years new, okay, to the industry, okay? And, okay, so everybody else older than that, we just assume that you know a lot more stuff than I do. Okay, <laughs> so let's take it from there. So the topic that was um, shared with us was sustainability. And, um, oh, you can't really see the pictures. Um, okay, I'll come back to the photograph in a bit. But, so the challenge is to talk about sustainability, which is re a really large concept within a very specific context. So the context of sustainability can be economic, and the context of sustainability could be ecology. And the context that we come from is a combination of both. Because we feel that economy drives whether or not ecology will survive. So if you look at this picture back here, it's basically Laiman's mom and his auntie. So his mom's a lady in the red, and the lady in front is his aunt, and the one in the, in the middle is the neighbor. So these three old ladies, who are happily retired, decided one day, let's start gardening. You know, let's start growing some food. And basically, they hijacked the whole back lane of their home uh, and they started growing so much of food to the point of abundance and they started sharing it with each other. So this was driven not because of economy, but because of boredom, right? So these <laughs> ladies, really, they're poor. They're, you know, they're highly functioning people. His mother used to be like an assistant <coughs> bank manager and when she retired, she had nothing to do. So she's like, what else can I do? What else can I do? You know, so you know, fidgeting, thing, right? So they started this project like, Five years ago, Lemon? Yeah, five years ago. And longer? Yeah, so they started in pots and then they migrated to like a bigger space. And this changed the way they connected with their neighbors. Because as soon as they started gardening, more people started gardening. And as more people started gardening, they all became specialists in somewhat, uh, in the kinds of food that they were producing for themselves. So they were swapping based on how much bumper crop they would have on a particular vegetable. So the reason why I share this with you is because sometimes it's not economy that drives the saving of ecology. Sometimes it is environmental empathy, and that's where we come in. Um, we are urban dwellers. Uh, we are, we, me and Lionel, we both grew up in PJ. We've seen how Petaling Jaya has changed over the years. I've seen how Kamantun has changed over the years. I now call Kamantun my home, and I've got members of my community who are here. And so, hi Ziki. So <laughs> ZP is part of our community group, which we are trying very hard to raise awareness of the sustainability of our neighborhood. So when I swing between food and neighborhood, the commonality is it's people. Three times a day, we have a relationship with a farmer. So whether you save 3,000 plastic bags, or you decide to grow your own food and know your neighbors, or you hang out for transition tea and get to know what's the issues within our neighborhood, it comes down to people. It's human factors. I'm an engineer by training. Every machine fails because of the human that's operating it. You know, whether it's a service point or it's at the point of which it's running and don't, nobody maintains it. So the thing is, sustainability is so much larger than I can complete in a conversation with you today. That is why we, we really feel the conversation of sustainability has to come from multiple angles and people need to understand their role. So when I say it's a human factor issue, I really mean it's a human factor issue. I am an issue too, because at the point of which I got life, I have been a consumer. My diapers, my milk, transportation to the clinic, you know, antibiotics, uh, food. So these are things that we have taken for granted that, you know, these are normal cycles. But these are choices. Every day we make these choices. Every day we choose whether we want to buy the new phone while the ones that we have still work. Right? So Souls has this awesome program where you can give your old phone away and then so it goes back into another cycle, and then we buy something else, not justified, but you know, we still consume something new, and that takes a whole lot of embedded energy. So if you learn anything out of this whole process of different speakers, take away embedded energy. Because if you understand embedded energy, you understand everything else. Everything else is just part of the puzzle. Embedded energy is the energy it takes to create a product. And it take, and remember Mr. Yang was saying, if you buy the noodle from the manufacturer, it's less packaged, it does not have labeling, you know what you're buying, you consume it within the month, therefore it doesn't have a shelf life. That whole process, the supply chain process, is embedded energy on food. 
So that's why people calculate food miles, ecological footprints. So all these things actually come down to the same point. It's people. So the people, the next speakers who speak after me are going to talk about different things. Uh, there are people who are going to talk about water and how water is important to life because nothing can happen without water. And then there's people talking about products. So the point of choice is yours. Whether you choose to buy something with an eco label or not is very different in terms of opinion. Like for me, I try to buy eco labels. I feel sometimes it's above my price range, but I understand the ethical value of it. So I look for an alternative source of purchase. I would probably buy like this, a very cotton-based, simple fabric with uh, natural ink dyes when I travel because I'm already there and I'm attending a conference and I do something and I stack. I stack the number of things I can do in one process. So if you're taking a trip from here, from KL to say PJ, how many things can you do on that route within that limited span of time is realistic for you. So those choices make a difference. Instead of traveling from here to PJ today, traveling again tomorrow, just because you didn't organize the things that you want to do. So choice and human factors are a big contributor to sustainability. And when I talk about ecological sustainability and environmental empathy, um, where I'm coming from is that most of you would think I don't, how to say, understand how difficult it is to live in a city. And I agree, because I choose to not live in an area which is highly populated. However, the choice is yours to walk. The choice is yours to tap out food, to bring food from home. The choice is yours to eat food that uh, does not come with more packaging. So it comes back to how do you perceive your purchasing and the power of your money. And there are many people who have alternative lifestyles where they eat microbiotically, they grow, they sprout their own greens. Uh, there are people who try to take a, or, you know, practice a vegan diet. There are people who do different things. So it's not just food, it's also consumption. So whether the clothes you buy are heavily bleached, come from far, far away, uh, or as you use them and they fade out, you keep using them for a different purpose. Like say, I would use this now and it's like nice, it's kind of new. So I'll use it for about a year and a half. As it starts to fade, I'll use it for gardening. And as that t-shirt then starts to rip and wear and tear, it turns into a rug. And as it goes down the supply chain, it, it literally go, it disappears. And the idea is to use everything uh, for the longest possible time and not to buy for the sake of buying. So purchasing is a big part of, um, of sustainability and it does affect the environment in a very large way. You may not see it, but I think you should investigate it. So if anything else, investigate. The more curious you are, uh, the more you will learn. And so I've got Lyman over there with his iPad telling me, make stuff, make stuff, yes. So reskilling is a big part of sustainability. So a lot of people forget how to make things. Like um, in, not my generation, maybe my, my mother's and my grandmother's generation, they used to still sew their own bajukuro. They used to still sew their own, um, maternity pad, their own bras, their own, you know, and, and this is a skill that we don't do anymore. We take for granted because it can be bought. And I'm not saying that everybody needs to go and make their own stuff, but it's a, it's a very interesting correlation that now as people phase out of um, building things with their hands, the capacity for the brain to function has reduced. Because every time, you know when children are very, very small, uh, they talk about fine motor functions and you teach them how to cut with the scissors, write with a pencil, and all this integrate with learning from the point of the brain into the body. So we as adults, we've lost this because we text with our thing with one thumb, we drive with our palm, uh, we hardly use the whole mobility of our, our hands. So there's a lot of knowledge in crafting that we have lost. And as we lose this, that's why we have to invest in yoga, and, <laughs> and what was it, um, um, those, those boot camps that make you run and push tires. You know what, farmers don't need yoga, farmers farm and they garden and, and they're healthy and they're, they're fit and they're lean. And it's not, so sustainability is not just an idea, it's not just a concept, it's not something that I can share with you over 10 minutes. It's something that you should walk away being curious. How does what I do in my everyday life affect the world around me? How does what I do influence choices within my organization? Like I used to have a, uh, I used to work for an oil and gas company and uh, my colleague basically did, he just made a little sticker 
and he stuck it on the printer and it says that, please print on both sides. And that's all he did. And we saved like a ton of paper. And that was when I first graduated and joined the industry. And I was like, huh, that's impact. But nobody cared, you know? But you know, for me, it affected me. It affected the way I perceived actions that translate into reactions. So yeah, uh, someone's flashing me a card that tells me I should stop. So I encourage you to ask me questions. Uh, you can find us at ecocentrictransitions.com. You can follow us on Instagram. You can, uh, I'm not very fast on Facebook, but yeah, we're happy to answer questions. Or if you're interested and you have time and you want to hang out, you want to learn something, you want to listen to Lionel's voice explaining to you how to build your own table, or to for us to explain to you the social injustice of the life that we think is, you know, Awesome. So there's a lot of, um, how to say, uh, unlearning. There's a lot of unlearning that can happen, and there's a lot of learning that can inspire you from there. So I'm going to pass the mic back to Pasin.